And I want to spend just a little bit of time in the book of Matthew together. And in the book of Matthew, we, we read, which was so wonderfully shared with us by our young lady, that Jesus went throughout all the towns of Judea, the towns and the villages, and he, was, he taught in their synagogues, and he was preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. That must have been pretty fantastic, don't you think? But yet, often as we read the Bible, we kind of, we read it very surfacely. And we'll, we'll read this passage and we imagine that, uh, you know, everything is good. And we just kind of will stay at the surface. And we don't often kind of dig down underneath to kind of really see what was going on. And, to, and to, uh, try to understand the challenges that the people that Jesus was teaching were facing themselves, but also Jesus himself faced. As he went from town to town preaching in their synagogues and healing diseases and sicknesses and it must have just been an incredible time. So, but what we want to do is we want to dig in just a little bit here today. Get underneath to see what some of these experiences must have been like. And what can we learn from it today is, as followers of Jesus 2,000 years later. So let's dig in together. So it's a Sabbath morning. And we're not told the exact time of day, but because of the sequence of the story, I'm going to assume here it was a morning. Now, often people talk about it like it's in the afternoon, and it could have been, but I'm presuming from the passage today that it was before church and in the morning. And so Jesus and his disciples head for the synagogue. Now, they didn't have church as we know it today, but for us it would be like the equivalent of going to church. So they are heading off to church. And some interesting things happened because apparently uh, they had not had a very good breakfast. Uh, did most of you have breakfast this morning? Now you've been, there's been lots of dinner with the doctors, and I presume you've learned good health here in Damascus. And that what, is breakfast an essential meal of the day? Let's have a lot of heads going up and down. Breakfast is essential. We will not ask you then how many of you had it this morning. I'm sure that you did. But apparently the disciples uh, were a little short this morning, and maybe they had run out of cornflakes at home or rice checks, whatever they had at the moment. And so they went, and they were passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath. It says his disciples were hungry, and to begin to pick some of the heads of grain and to eat them. Seems reasonable enough, except that it was the Sabbath day, and the local custom was that you weren't supposed to go into the grain field. Yeah, you could eat grain, of course, but you certainly weren't supposed to pick it on the Sabbath and to harvest it, as they would interpret it. This was bad stuff. And it wasn't like, uh, you know, Jesus and his disciples were only by themselves, so they could kind of do this and kind of sweep it under the, under the pew, so to speak. Ever done some activities that you know might be frowned upon? And you kind of look around to see if anybody else is there, and is anybody watching you as you do it? And you kind of breathe a sigh of relief if there's no one around. Well, that wasn't the case here. They're in the grain fields. They are, quote, harvesting and eating because they're short on breakfast. Hit the wrong button here. And it just so happens that uh, some of the local spiritual leaders, the Pharisees, were along on the trip to church. And so they're there and they're watching what's going on. It says, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to Jesus, they said, look, look, your disciples are doing something very bad. They are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. The critics are right there to draw attention to what is going wrong. And it's wrong. And so an argument ensues on the way to church. And Jesus gets into, into the, with them as to discussing as to why it was okay for what the disciples were doing. And they're going back and forth. And this is how they start their Sabbath day. By the way, how did your Sabbath day start today? Is it permitted to ask that question? 
You remember I said often as we worshiped here together that we all come looking really nice, don't we? If I was to hold a mirror up so you could see yourselves, you'd say, we dress up pretty well, we clean up good. And you do. But what happened on the way to church this morning? What happened at home with your better or worse half? I'll let you decide whether your partner is better or worse today. Is it possible that things didn't go so well? Because what we first want to learn today is that the enemy really is displeased when you take the time to come to fellowship and to worship. Do you realize that? Most of the people in this world are right where the enemy wants them, and that is not in a fellowship, not where they're worshiping. They could be going out and playing a little golf. They could be going shopping. They could be staying home and sleeping. Not bad activities in and of themselves, but not necessarily what God wants them to be. Because there's something that you, there is something that is unique that happens within the four walls of this facility. When we come together as believers to worship God. And the enemy doesn't want you there. So, if he can't keep you home doing something else, he then tries to cause problems along the way. So that once you get there, you're not going to experience the blessing that God has in store for you. Because God knows where you're at this morning. He hasn't lost track of you. God's pretty busy, you know. He has the universe to run. He has nations to uh, keep in line. He has politics to oversee, and what a mess that is, huh? But in all that stuff, he hasn't lost sight of Aster. Never has. He knows where you're at. He says, I have something for you today. And the enemy wants to disrupt that. The enemy is not stupid. He says, so how can I cause problems? And so it was very likely this morning that things didn't go maybe like you had planned, or maybe you had hoped. And so you come to church filled with angst and stress, and maybe not even feeling particularly close to God. Anybody feel that way? Sometimes when you come to church, you can be honest, remember? We can be honest. Yeah, I see a few heads going up and down. Yeah, you come to church, yeah, I don't feel so good because things haven't gone so well. And I don't feel very spiritual right now. Some of us just flat out have argued on the way to church. The pastor and his wife do this occasionally, in case you've forgotten how human Cindy and I are. We argue once in a while, don't we, dear? Never. We never argue, because I just have to say, yes, ma'am. There should be no husbands laughing here right now, because I know how hard it is. It ain't natural for us to say, yes, dear, is it? Yeah, see, it's good to be honest with each other. But, so we argue, and we get uh, all bent out of shape, and the enemy wants it that way because he doesn't want us to pay attention. So, so just now, even as we're getting into this, if you've had a rough day so far, a rough Sabbath, then just pause a moment and ask God to, to, to send the devil packing so you can hear what has to be said yet today in the sermon. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm struggling today. I'm irritable about this or that. But I want to let it go because I want to hear what you have to say to me. And I know you got something for me today. And he's listening to you. And he's going to give you freedom. So don't let the enemy get in the way of your Sabbath blessing today. Now, the devil has other issues, however, that he can kind of work on. Because... Even if you've managed to surmount, with God's grace, the irritations, the difficulties, the upsetness perhaps of domestic affairs this morning, or problems at work that you've carried over in your thought processes to today, He has other traps waiting for us as we gather together as God's people, as God's saints, to worship Him and to be changed by His grace. And we're going to discover what one of those things is as we continue on in the story. Because as the story continues a little further down in Matthew, it says that going on from that place, Jesus went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Everybody, you know, everybody hold your hands up. I want to make sure no one's going to sleep. Hold your hands up. Everybody hold your hand up. Come on, everybody hands up. There you go. See? Okay. I don't see any shriveled hands. Everybody's hands looks pretty good. 
That wasn't the case that day. There was an there individual there who was a cripple. We don't know why, don't know what had happened to him, but his hand was a cripple. But before we can even, before Jesus even has a chance, you know, Jesus' ministry is going from place to place and he's teaching and he's healing all sorts of diseases. So, you know, we know kind of what's going to happen, but we don't even get to what's going to happen. We don't even get to that divine activity, that exciting moment in time, because Jesus and his disciples hadn't come to church alone. It says that looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they, well, who's they? It's the critics who have already been arguing with Jesus and his disciples on the way to church, who have caused all the difficulty. And so, if the devil can't keep the disciples from their Sabbath blessing, he's going to send the critics and the hypocrites along with them to try to find another avenue a little later on to cause problems. And so they are the Pharisees. And they, they, they were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. They asked him, by the way, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? So we discover that the hypocrites had followed Jesus to church. See, the enemy says, well, if I can't keep them from church, then I'm going to try to get them to focus on each other. Because while they look really nice on the outside, I know what's on the inside of them. And a lot of it isn't very pretty. And while they may dress up and look really nice, I know they don't always live up to what they profess. They're hypocrites. And if I can just get these churchgoers to think about the deficit in the spiritual life of their neighbor, then it's okay if they have gone to church today because they're not going to get the blessing that I intend for them. Isn't there fertile ground? to be critical of each other? You've raised your hands and that's good. Now I want you to turn your head, get that neck going like this, because you're all staring at me. Look at each other. Look at the person beside you. Need you really look at them to understand their difficulties and their problems and their challenges? They're not perfect, are they? Now, I know, Judith, you're looking and you're saying, oh, I have the perfect husband. No, 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 no. Yeah, 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 he's laughing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we know there's imperfections and we look at each other and the devil says, look at these people and, and they're coming to church. What are they doing here today? See, there are hypocrites in church. How can that husband of mine be praying right now? Has he forgotten what he said to me this morning? Those words that he said that were so cutting that stabbed me to the heart and made me want to cry? Could that have been the case? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We listened to someone singing up front. I've stood here often to sing. It's a wonderful thing to do. And we sing about loving the Lord and surrendering to Him. And my wife is sitting out here on the third row saying, man, he sure was prideful this week. He was wrong and he knew it and he, didn't, and he, he knew it and he was just too stubborn to admit it. And, and when's he going to come around to understanding that? And yet, he's singing like a cherub up front. Yeah, there's, there's hypocrites in church. And what the enemy really wants to do is to separate us. 
Because, see, God does something really unique when we come into these four walls and he, he works through all our frailties and the weaknesses. You know, he first he saves us, but he doesn't just stop at that. Then he starts to kind of bind our hearts together and to help us to begin to kind of be concerned about each other and love each other and really uh, look out for the benefit of each other and see what we can do. To We start to act like loving Christians and like Jesus might have been like. And this is not what the enemy wants. And so his goal is to separate us constantly, to get us to see these imperfections. And what happens is we get so distracted because we're thinking about our partner who is praying probably impiously and without having confessed their sin. And while we're so busy worrying about that, we're not praying very much either. And we're not coming before God ourselves. And we're missing what God has for us because we're so worried about that person beside us, that imperfect person. Who, how could they be coming before God's throne? Yeah, there are hypocrites in church. But here's the truth that we all have to grasp. The only hypocrite-free church is the empty church. I promise you that. This sanctuary was hypocrite-free at 5 o'clock this morning because there was nobody here. Now, I'm not going to ask who the deacon was today who came in and opened up. Or the deaconess. Well, I mean, Patty, don't point them I'm not looking. Don't, don't point them out. I don't want to get overly personal here. But whoever it was who came in the back door here and turned the lights on ruined the hypocrite free church. And anybody who knows that person intimately knows that I'm telling the truth. Because while we are on the road following Jesus, He's not finished with His work with us yet. And what we strive to attain, we have not yet attained. But yet by God's grace, we keep on the journey and we keep striving to attain. And that's how God would have it. He doesn't fix us all at once. We wish he would, especially our partner. But no, God doesn't see that that's how it should happen. And so this is what we have to face. Now, if you think that I'm just making this up, let's look at Romans. Paul's really plain. He says, there is no one righteous, not even one. So that pretty is plain, don't you think? There is no one who is righteous. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And the Paul makes it really plain. He says, you therefore have no excuse. I hate it when I have no excuse. Ever tried to argue with someone when you have no excuse? Yeah. All you can do is shout, jump up and down, because there's no excuse. Paul says, there is no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Ouch! I wish Paul could be a little less plain. He just puts it out there. So, by God's grace, listen to the Holy Spirit. Because when the devil comes and says, look at that fellow there. You know what he does Monday to Friday. He shouldn't be even allowed in the back door. Remember that you shouldn't be either. 
because none of us are here except by the grace of the Lord Jesus who gave himself for us. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Yeah. And that is why we are here. And that is why we are able to have God's blessing poured out on us. It's because of God's grace, not because we've done anything to deserve it. So yeah, there are hypocrites in church. And here's the first one. By God's grace, that won't keep you from receiving the blessing that God intends for you today. The next thing that we have to realize is that the reason that this is true is because, yeah, there are hypocrites in church, but so is Jesus. We get uh, so confused because we can only see ourselves. But we talked in Sabbath school class this morning about angels, the ministering spirits that God has who ministers to the saints. That's us. We can't see them very often, but they're ministering. But in the same way, Jesus through the Holy Spirit is with us. And the story in the story, Jesus is in that congregation. Yes, the hypocrites followed Jesus to church, but He is there. We may be sitting in our pew looking pious and deceiving others and having all sorts of problems. But Jesus is there. Do we understand that Jesus is... He doesn't say that hypocrisy is okay. But Jesus hung out with hypocrites. You say, I don't know about that. Oh, yes, he did. It says Jesus hung around sinners. In fact, this was the charge of the spiritual people that Jesus hung around all the people who didn't merit religious favor. Those who were questionable in the synagogue, and they said, he hangs around with these people. Praise God he hangs around with those people, right? Because that means he'll hang around you and me. So Jesus is there with the hypocrites in church. He, he says very plainly, Matthew 18, 20, says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I, what? Well, you know, we all look like we've probably passed at least a little bit of math in our scholastic endeavors. Look around, let's count. One, two, three, we've met the requirement, there we are. Jesus says, my presence is with you. Now, we think, oh, how lucky it was back in the days in the synagogue, they had Jesus with them. Jesus, through the presence of the Spirit, is here with us right now. Just as surely as he was there with that crippled man and with his critics. That's the blessing we have today of being gathered here together in the name of Jesus. What an incredible blessing that is for us. And the nice thing is that Jesus just doesn't kind of stand there next to the hypocrites. No, he engages with hypocrites. He engages a hypocrite like me because he loves me so much. And he loves you. In spite of your hypocrisy, in spite of your issues, in spite of your problems, Jesus loves you. And so he engages with you. And he did that day in church. He said to the critics, to the hypocrites, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Different people in church need different things. The crippled man, the man with the crippled hand, he needed something from Jesus. But the Pharisees didn't have crippled hands. The Pharisees didn't have a physical disability as far as we know, but they were just as in need of healing that day as the man with the crippled hand. In fact, they needed a deeper sort of healing. Because they were plain righteous while out to get Jesus. 
They didn't care about the man with the crippled hand. They cared about finding a way to destroy Jesus and his ministry. Yet Jesus loved them anyway. And he knew what they needed. They needed the straight testimony. There's a lot sometimes around the church people talk about the straight testimony. Now often I'm very leery of people with the straight testimony. They're very eager to give it to someone else and not really to accept it themselves. Ah, so you got to be careful with this. But, you didn't, but Jesus had no problems that day. Jesus knew exactly what was in the heart. He knew what they needed. And He comes to them with a straight testimony. He says, now which one of you isn't going to do this? And I'm sure they all just kind of, well, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> he says, isn't this person here much more valuable than a sheep? And so whatever we need when we come into this building, yes, we are filled with hypocrisy, we have issues, and other people have the same, but Jesus knows particularly what we need that day, and He is working maybe through another church member here, maybe through a guest, maybe through the pastor, maybe through a song that's going to be sung, I don't know, it's different every week, but He has something particularly that you need today. And that is, by the way, why the enemy doesn't want you to come to church. Because God in His wisdom works through the community of believers, as imperfect as it is. So what is God telling you today? How is He meeting your need? Is He putting His finger on a sore spot maybe? Tweaking just a little bit? putting some questions in your mind. But He has what you need today. This is why He brought you here. See, Jesus came for hypocrites. I'm always a bit saddened. It's kind of a humor, but sad when people say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. And I say, praise God. <laughs> Would you rather have them in church where Jesus can try to deal with them? Or you know, where they, they, they have to be in a community of believers where they can be held accountable, they can be challenged, they can be uh, encouraged to grow? See, Jesus came for those of us who need Him. I have not come to call the righteous, Jesus said. So if you feel righteous today, that doesn't mean you have a corner on Jesus. Jesus said He didn't come for someone who doesn't feel the need, who feels like they have it all together. He comes from someone who realizes, who knows they have issues. He came to call sinners, and that, by the way, is hypocrites. And that's you, and that's me. But that's who Jesus loves, and that's who He comes for. That's who He takes time on the Sabbath to bless. You know, we forget about God often. Why did God create Sabbath? To, to help prove our loyalty? To give us a test of obedience? God originally created Sabbath so He could be with us. You know, He actually likes us. He actually loves us. So much so, He wants us to spend eternity with Him. And so Sabbath, He wants us sinners, hypocrites, the challenge the spiritually crippled, to come into His presence because He likes being with us and He wants to begin to change us in community and in relationship to Him. So He loves to be with us. He doesn't say, well, I guess there's going to be a few souls at Damascus Grace today. I suppose we should send a few angels there. Holy Spirit, pour out a little blessing over there because they showed up. No! He says, I get to meet with my people in Damascus. How awesome it is, and I have something for them today. Oh, they have needs, but I've got everything they need. 
All power has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Jesus said. And so, in fulfillment of that promise, as we come together as a fellowship, as we do not absent ourselves from fellowship, we can expect the blessing of Jesus to be poured out on us. So then Jesus said to the man, he said, stretch out. You know, this happens to me often. I remember being up here all the time and confessing when I got the spelling right or wrong, you know? It's ridiculous. It doesn't say stretch out our hand. It says stretch out your hand, okay? I, ah, see, John, I haven't changed at all. Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored just as sound as the other. Somebody say amen, please. So Jesus reaches out and touches the man who was crippled and restores his hand, not just a little bit, not partially, so that it was just as good as the other hand. Now, let's ask ourselves a question. <laughs> we don't want to miss out on being healed, do we? Ever thought of that? See, this is why we have to dig deep underneath these stories and not just stop at the surface that, yeah, Jesus went around healing and teaching. And no, no, no. We have to dig down to the stories and really think about them and let the Holy Spirit apply them into our hearts. What if that crippled man had decided that because there were hypocrites in church, he was going to stay home that day? Who would he have missed out on? Jesus? The healing of his hand? Would he have been wrong? Were there hypocrites in church? Yep. Were there people in church that day who did not receive a blessing from Jesus? Yes, there were. But did that stop him from receiving the blessing that Jesus had specifically prepared for him? Absolutely not. Yeah, what would have happened if the crippled man had stayed home to avoid the hypocrites in church that day? Because they were there. The end of the story is really sobering. It says in verse 14, But the Pharisees went out and plotted that they might kill Jesus. So Jesus gave them what they needed. He gave them the straight testimony. He gave them the witness that they needed. And they said, No, thank you. They missed the blessing. They missed a changed heart. They went home in worse shape than when they came to church because they went out and they decided, let's, we have got to stop this guy's ministry. He's a problem. Let's figure out how to kill this guy who thinks he's the Messiah. So there is no guarantee that everybody in church who Jesus wants to reach out to, who has a blessing for, is going to receive that blessing because they don't have to accept it. But that doesn't stop you from receiving the blessing that God intends. Amen. We're urged in the New Testament to not, to not forsake the gathering together. We are together, we are to press together even more as we see the incoming. Not because the church has become perfect. Not because Sister Jones finally has it together. Not because Gideon is perfect. No, but because we need more and more the blessing of God. The closer we get to the consummation of all things. This is why he says, come together. Don't fret over who's next to you. Don't fret over the difficulty at work. Don't fret 
right now over your spouse who clearly has difficulties and problems. Don't fret of the person who you're sure is damaging the church. Ask Jesus to heal you today, to bring you that measure of healing that you need, whether it be spiritual, whether it be physical, emotional. Because Jesus loves you. He knows what you need. And he has it for you today. If you will accept it. Now what is it for you? I don't know. It's going to be different than what it is for me. But what I know for sure is that Jesus is here to give it to you and to me if we are willing. In a moment, the song team and the praise team is going to come up. We're going to sing, I believe, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Is that right? Make sure? Great How great thou art. Thank you. How great God is. That He would work with us in this manner. The song speaks of the, the Creator God. But let's not get distracted from the main concept that the Creator God wants to recreate in us. The image of Jesus, which is filled with happiness and joy and love and peace. That is what God's after today.